change is hard. And that's why most people don't do it. The only thing we can manage is ourselves and our discomfort with the change and our desire to be a different person and our desire to grow in our relationships with people. You don't have to be a dysfunctional human being. From To Be Magnetic, this is The Expanded Podcast with your host, Lacey Phillips. And your host, Jessica Gill. As the leading destination for neural manifestation, we dispel the woo-woo in order to help you create real, tangible results based on neuroplasticity, psychology, epigenetics, and energetics. Our goal is to normalize the practice of manifestation and empower you to get into the driver's seat of your life in order to manifest the experiences, relationships, and things that most align with your authenticity. Part of our manifestation process entails expanding past your limiting subconscious beliefs. Therefore, by tuning into this podcast with interviews from experts, thought leaders, spiritual teachers, scientists, and those with neural manifestation success stories, you're starting the process of expanding your subconscious in order to see to believe that anything you desire is possible. And by pressing play, the process begins. Welcome back, everyone, to the Expanded Podcast. Jessica here. One question we get asked a lot at TBM is, as I'm setting boundaries and up-leveling and finding new ways to cultivate and connect with my self-worth, how do I deal with the people who are still in their dysfunctional patterns in their life? Maybe you don't want to cut them out fully and maybe they're family members. So that makes it even more difficult to do. Today's guest is going to speak to exactly that. We have back on the Expanded Podcast, Nedra glover Tawab. Nedra is a licensed therapist, sought after relationship and boundaries expert, as well as a New York Times bestselling author. And her latest book, Drama Free, A Guide to Managing Unhealthy Family Relationships, hit the bookstores this past February. Nedra has appeared as an expert on The Red Table Talk, The Breakfast Club, Good Morning America, CBS Morning Show, just to name a few. And her true philosophy is that a lack of boundaries and assertiveness underlie most of our relationship issues. So if you are someone that is grappling to set boundaries and family dynamics, is trying to validate your own experience, trying to not bypass maybe difficult dynamics that are occurring, and how do you cultivate a relationship with family members that really are not willing to change or do the work? And how do we learn to accept them and also uphold boundaries so we are protecting ourselves at the same time? Because when we decide to no longer participate in the dysfunctional patterns of our family, we can break generational cycles and generational curses. There is so much in this episode. I'm so excited for you guys to all dive in and I hope you enjoy the episode. And now a word from our partners. So you've heard Lacey share about her experience with the Bond Charge sauna blanket and truly it is a manifestation come through for me as well. It is one of the number one things I get asked on from friends about how is it. So I'm going to share all my insights and tips around it here. The thing that I love about the Bond Charge blanket specifically that other blankets on the market don't have is that it is A, the lowest in EMF. You're getting the strongest high quality infrared lights in the blanket and all non-toxic materials that after you deeply sweat in the sauna, it's super easy. You just take a cloth, non-toxic spray, and just spray down the inside. So, so easy to take care of. And the thing that really sells me on the Bond Charge blanket over any other blanket I've used on the market is that you can go in with no clothes on. A lot of other blankets get so hot that you need a lot of layers to protect you from some of the infrared layers that are going on in there. 
the bond charge blanket is so well insulated that you can go in completely in the buff, sweat it out. You don't have to dry out your clothes. You don't have to wring out your socks. You can just come out, wipe down the blanket, take a nice cold shower, rinse off and be so, so incredibly rejuvenated. It has been a game changer, like I said, in my mental health, physical health, detoxification. I can't say enough good things about it. If you're looking for a sauna blanket, if you don't have space for a big infrared sauna, or if you want a infrared way to detox in your home where you can lay down and be most comfortable, I highly, highly recommend. And you can get 15% off with code MAGNETIC, all caps, that's M-A-G-N-E-T-I-C for 15% off. You can go to bondcharge.com slash pages slash magnetic and see all the wonderful products that Bond Charge also has to offer. So as you guys know, we had a huge up level this year and we're able to build out an even more effective integrated behind the scenes and for our customers platform where we can host all of our memberships and community groups. And we're so excited to announce that we have partnered with Kajabi to make this all happen. So Kajabi is an all-in-one business platform for knowledge entrepreneurs. They make it easy to build, market, and sell your online courses, membership sites, coaching programs, and more. And best of all, you don't need to learn to code or have to worry about plugging plugins or broken integrations. And as a small business, one of the issues that we came across so many times is that from our payment methods to our backend websites, to our membership emails, none of the tech communicated with each other and caused glitches and issues. But Kajabi solved that problem as an all-in-one spot. So we could build our landing website. We can have all of our membership access in one place, have all of our online courses built out custom to the way that we want them. We can have our secure payment gateway in there, email integration, sales funnel software, our email marketing software, and analytics all in one place. And one of the best parts is they have incredible customer service. If you're a business owner out there, if you're thinking of launching an online course, perhaps have a membership site, even a coaching program, maybe you even want to host your public or private podcast, you can do it now all in one place, including send emails to those people and get real time analytics. Kajabi is partnering with TBM and offering you guys a one month free trial. So they do custom plans depending upon what you need for your business. You can go in, sign up for the free trial, see a plan that works perfectly for your business and your business's needs and see how effective Kajabi truly is. And I promise once you join, you will not look back. It has been such an incredible experience and just so grateful that companies like this exist who are really thinking of every single step for the business owner. So if you want to try out the free month trial, you can go to the link in our show notes where we'll have a custom URL where you can claim your free 30-day trial and check out more of what Kajabi has to offer. All right, on to the episode. Nedra, we are so excited to have you back on this time for the release of your second book. Well, I guess technically it's kind of your third because you did a workbook with the first one. And now this is your second full book. I finished reading it this week. It's incredible. So needed. It's so funny. Even the title, when I was out reading it in coffee shops, people were like, oh, wait, I need that. What is that? And they kept asking me so many questions. Ooh. So excited. I'm just going to read the title for everyone. A guide to managing unhealthy family relationships, drama free. This is so needed. So tell us, tell us about the book. What prompted you to move on to this one as your second book? Well, the book is everything that people with unhealthy, dysfunctional family relationships need to know. Um, Not just childhood relationships, but also adulthood relationships with family, be it biological family, in-laws, blended family, all of it. This is the book. I transitioned to this book because when I wrote Set Boundaries, Find Peace, there were so many questions about family. Like, I know you talk about families, but what do you do with your family? I'm like, I (laughs) said it. (laughs) They were like, no, you didn't say it. So I was like, oh, okay. I need a whole book to help people who have these really, really unhealthy relationships because they're not seeing that the boundaries are with the family members too. 
it's like there's these exceptions we make in our head for unhealthy family relationships. It's like, my sister does this, but it's my sister. My mother does this, but it's my mother. How do I make her a different person? When really what we need to learn is to meet people where they are and, you know, maybe not continue in a relationship, or maybe we need to show up differently, or maybe we need to say things a different way, or maybe we need to change our expectations of this person. Because someone being your mother or your brother, it doesn't mean that they are born with certain qualities. So this book is really about learning how to accept family and to figure out how you want to be in relationship with them and if you want to be in those relationships. Oh my gosh, so, so needed. And it's kind of the the core modeling of any relationship going forward, if you think about it. You're repeating similar patterns probably with friend groups or romantic relationships. And so if you can really examine the role in which you play with the family, then it can kind of spread from there too. Yeah, we are ourselves with everyone. And we don't realize that, that those conflicts that we have with women are some of the same conflicts we have with our mother, our sisters. You know, some of that lack of trust that we have with our partners, it comes from the lack of trust we may have with our parents. So there is this ripple effect that we may not pay attention to because we're like, oh, I'm just existing in a world. And it's like, you're existing with your narrative. You're existing with your story. And that stuff doesn't go away because you've left home. It doesn't go away because you're not with you know, this particular person. Sometimes people don't trust their parents. When a person doesn't trust their parent, how do you think you trust friends? How do you think you trust partners? All of that stuff is this overlapping of, of who we are. One space I want to kind of start in is the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, and some of the impacts from that. And I love how you showcase it in the book very, very clearly, but then you also add in It's not a limited list. There are other things that really, really impact dysfunction in a family dynamic. So kind of explain to everyone what that is, if they're hearing about it for the first time and how people can even, I mean, I went in to take it online. I I did it in therapy years ago, but even going back in, I was like, oh, wow, I have a lot more of these than I realized I had. So yeah, touch on that a bit. Well, the A score is a measurement of how much childhood trauma a person has experienced. And it it goes from one to 10, right? So 10 different events. So, you know, some of them might include witnessing domestic violence, growing up without um, one or more parents, a person in your home having an issue with substance abuse, being physically or sexually abused and all these other factors. And the interesting thing about the AC is you can have as little as two of those things and have some impact from those things. Because there are times where people like to say, oh my gosh, this this person has an eight. And it's like, well, a two can resemble someone with an eight because it's not how much has happened to us. It's about how much we're impacted by what happened to us. There are other things that, you know, may alleviate some of the trauma, right? Like having a caring adult, having, you know, social activities. So that person with an eight may have more of those other things than the person with a two. So it's really hard to say, oh, because of this score, this is how you'll end up in life or this is how you were impacted. It. I mentioned that in the book because I think it's important information, but I also want people to know no matter what your A score is, a 10, you can have a 10. You don't have to be a dysfunctional human being. I think that's so important. And I think it also gives context to like what is trauma. You know, I have friends who they had an alcoholic parent and they're like, well, I didn't really have trauma. They're not really even processing what they may have gone through within the system of the family home, especially if they got out of the system and they're not an alcoholic or they had a different pattern. They don't see kind of the ways in which it still might be impacting or hitting them. And I think it gives licensing to people to say, okay, yes, 
by the studies and by the science, having these experiences will impact you. How have they impacted me? It like allows you to kind of look in and validate your experience. I, and I've heard that too from children of alcoholics. And I don't know many children of alcoholics who have no scars. I think there are so many things with alcoholism. Let's start here. It is one of the more common substance abuse issues. And unfortunately, it's very socially acceptable. I mean, most places you go as an adult, there is alcohol present. I was telling a friend, you know, I I feel like I had some significant childhood trauma and I never had a drink. Now, as an adult, it's almost like everywhere you go, oh, you're sad, get a drink. Mm -hmm. All I did was have a long day at work. (laughs) In childhood, I had more than that and I wasn't getting a drink. But it's, it's such a common thing now. And when you think about a child of an alcoholic, first off, not knowing what you'll come home to every day, not having any predictability. You know, I had a neighbor once who this woman was in her 60s and she told me I never drove because my dad was a really bad alcoholic and I just never wanted to drive. She said, even in the car now, I have to take a pill to get in the car and go places because I have really bad anxiety. She said her dad would be so drunk driving, she would get in the back seat and just curl up in a ball. This is a 60 year old woman. So when people say like, I don't think I was impacted, you know, I I think sometimes it's the stuff you live with that you normalize. Malcolm Gladwell said most people are not good at detecting lies, but you know who can tell above all other people? Children of alcoholics. Because you have to figure out how drunk your parent is. You have to figure out, is this the time where if you say that, I mean, just all these things. So I think when people have these things of my dad wasn't present and I wasn't impacted or this happened and I have no impacts, it leaves me with a lot of questions. I love how you said, too, that it's what have you been normalizing? Mm -hmm. You know, because the impact has happened, but are you recognizing it as impact? Are you recognizing it as infringing on your mental health, your well-being, your anxiety, your hypervigilance, your PTSD, like all of these things that people are not registering or connecting back to these childhood experiences? Yes. And then some of the other ones that you had listed out there too, like financial instability, moving multiple times, generational trauma, self-absorbed parents, emotionally immature, domineering, enmeshed family dynamics, competitive relationships within family, parentification of children. I mean, there's so many other things that you can peel away that are creating that trauma cycle. And I think for anyone listening, they're like, okay, cool. So I may have some of these things. I'm going to go take my ACE thing online, see where I'm at. Once they recognize that, how can they really understand how generational trauma operates? Because I think sometimes, you know, in the the case of the alcoholic example, you know, you have a parent who's an alcoholic, but the child's not an alcoholic. So like, cool, broke the cycle. But what are the other ways it's impacting them going forward? You know, could that child be perhaps emotionally shut down and then they're emotionally shut down for their parents and then the cycle continues in that way that's different? How do you define generational trauma? Generational trauma is dysfunction that happens across age groups. So Whatever those dysfunctions are, it could be alcoholism, it could be emotional neglect, it could be physical abuse, it could be substance abuses of other kinds. I think sometimes we minimize it because it's such a a regular occurrence. When you think about physical abuse, sometimes parents will, you know, minimize it. Well, this is, this is how I used to, I'm, I'm not beating you how I was beat. It's like, well, you're still beating. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So that is, that is still generational trauma to, you know, abuse a child, even if it's less than what you receive. So sometimes people will try to do a little bit less and say that, oh gosh, I broke the cycle because I'm doing this a little bit better, when in actuality, it has to be a complete extinction of that thing. And it's usually extinguished when we can start to name and deal with what that was that happened to us. With generational trauma, it repeats because in environments, there's this culture of how we should be. 
And within that culture, there are these these norms and there's this expectation. And when anyone jumps outside of what the norm is or or who you're supposed to be, it's like, oh my gosh, like you're ostracized by the rest of the people in the cultural system. And it's it's really interesting that this happens in families because in most families, you'll see people saying things like, I want the best for you. I want you to be smart and I want you to be that. But what if the environment is what's keeping you from being your best? What if the environment is what's keeping you from, you know, maybe breaking this generational pattern? So sometimes you have to consider that as well. Like, can you be in this cultural system and be this, you know, healthier version of yourself? I think too, when people start to recognize the dysfunction you had a chapter on this in the book too, which is like about the the minimizing and denying of it because of the shame of the other people in the system for upholding like, oh, no, 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 we're not that family or that's not a family secret we're going to let out or that was an anomaly. Like, you know, we don't talk about that. It'll just go away. Talk a bit about shame and the impact that that has and why it kind of keeps these dynamics stuck and hidden and perpetuates sort of this cycle. Well, shame is saying, I am what happened to me, right? And so when people know the truth of the stuff that happened to you, you may think that they start to see you a certain way. And I think that when we're honest with people, the people who love us and who we're supposed to be in relationships with will not hold your past against you. They won't hold your family story against you or even what you had to do to survive. Sometimes we just don't have that trust in people because shame can be taught. Many people in unhealthy families are taught not to say anything. You don't talk about what happens here. This is our business. This is, you know, there's this sort of, You're a snitch. You're telling on us. I can't believe you would say that about us. I know some families where it may even be like, you're lying. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, like they they see the truth as a lie because they don't want to see themselves. So it's easier to see this truth as a lie than to say, oh, that's actually what happened. How do you deal with someone in the family saying those things? As someone's coming at you and saying, that's not true, or just get over it, like it's not that big a deal, or they minimize it, they deny it, like what are some of the ways that someone could approach when someone comes back to them? In theory, we're, you know, we have a choice. We can set boundaries. We can walk away. We can create a new relationship dynamic with them. But I think in the moment, there's so much, I guess, lack of self-validation of what happened. So when you're faced with a parent or an entire family that's like, no, 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 get over it. It's just you. They can almost self-gaslight. And that is a really hard thing to step through. Yeah, that is a really hard thing to step through. But pretending is really dishonoring to ourselves. And when you lie, you pretend. If I have to go along with your lie of what this is, I am pretending that this is okay. And it is not. I have a problem with this. So how do we stand in our truth even when this other person is lying? You know, we can be very clear and matter of fact and say that's not true. That's not how that happened. Now, sometimes we feel like, oh, if I say that, I have to make them believe my version. No, you don't. You just have to disagree with theirs. Their disbelief is what's preserving them. If they were to acknowledge what ha- what happened, they may not be able to deal with themselves. They may not be able to deal with their story. So you saying, I, that's not what happened. I don't see it that way. That is not my truth. You are saying, I refuse to, to see this in the way that you are trying to paint it. And sometimes people are trying to paint a story that they can live with. It's not the truth. It's, this is what I can live with. This is the version of what happened that works for me. People say this a lot with their parents. Parents will make up certain things to make it seem as if, you know, every day after school, I would do da da da. It's like, mom, you never did that. And and it could have been their intention, but they never did it. Or that's how they want you to perceive them. And some people will, will do things and they will say it's not true. 
I had a situation when I was in high school and a family member gaslit me. They did something really awful. After the situation occurred, they came to me with a lie and said, you know, this is what happened. I was like, no, that's not true. They didn't talk to me for a year because I wouldn't agree with them. I was not bending. I was not going to give in because I had done it my whole life. I think I was like 16 or 17. I had done it my whole life of, okay, you're right. Okay. And I was just fed up. I was like, you know what? No, you are wrong. (laughs) I was like, I am am sticking this out. (laughs) And eventually they came back to me and they tried to say it again. And I was just like, no, it didn't happen that way. I refuse to pretend that things happen in the way, because I had witnesses. I had witnesses. So I was like, I am not making this up. This is not, this is what you need me to believe so that you think I would be okay with this, but I'm not okay with it. I'll continue in this relationship, but I remember this. I'm not holding it against you, but you will not say that this did not happen in this way. You talk about change a lot and what it takes to get someone to make that change, right? From keeping the peace, which sounds like what you typically do, to I'm fed up. I'm not keeping the peace. I'm keeping my peace. Talk about that change structure. I love the breakdown that you have in the book, too, of kind of each level it takes to get to a place of change. And it's so funny as I was going through, I was like, oh yeah, for sure. I've definitely made all the change, set all the boundaries. And I look in, I'm like, oh no, I'm more towards the middle. (laughs) I haven't quite fully committed to all of those change making behaviors yet. So what do you think it takes for someone to make that shift, to stop keeping the peace, to stop being quiet and to stand in their boundaries? Being tired, You know, I mentioned my situation. I was just tired. It was like, I'm going to have to do this forever. I'm going to be lying to this person about how destructive their behavior is forever. How is that helping this situation? It's really not. It's upholding their poor behavior. Nothing is changing with them. I'm frustrated. I have to pretend that I'm not because this person is unwilling to hear the truth. So I I think we change when we get tired of things being the way they are, when we feel like our lives will be enhanced by the change, when we want something different, when we want to grow in a different way. There are tons of reasons that people don't change. Change is really hard. And that's why I don't think we should change other people, (laughs) because it's hard enough for me to remember to not grab my phone in the morning. How dare I try to tell somebody else, you better not grab your phone. I'm like, I'm on my own struggle bus. I can't, (laughs) I certainly can't manage your, your situation. Change is hard. And that's why most people don't do it. The only thing we can manage is ourselves and our discomfort with the change and our desire to be a different person and our desire to grow in our relationships with people. I can't make someone else do that. And often when we have dysfunctional relationships, one of the ones I hear about the most is mother-in-laws. How do I make my mother-in-law stop gossiping about me? You can't. Now, here's what you can do. You can control the information you share with your mother-in-law. You can talk to your mother-in-law about the things that you know that she said. You can ask her not to do it, but you can't make her stop. There's no way to do that. You could go to her and cry and all of the. You cannot make her stop. There are so many things that you can do that you can control. You can't control her actions. And that's really hard for us to acknowledge like my partner, my siblings, my mom, my dad, I really can't control what they do. How do you think people get to that place of acceptance? Because I think you can intellectually be like, yeah, yeah, I accept that's who they are. But your behaviors are still trying to get them to change their behavior or you're holding on to that hope. And that's when I think, you know, sometimes, especially kids, when it's with a parent-child dynamic, they'll internalize it and be like, well, if I'm just like this, they'll be different. If I shift me, then you know, they'll be different. How how can people start to separate and be like, you have nothing to do with their behavior? How do we get to real acceptance? It's a process. You know, I think the process of getting there is much trial and error. And then we really get to a point where we realize all of the fixing and meddling that we were trying to do is just really, 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 really not working, is not going to work, is not meant to work. 
we have to get to that place of really being able to see that all of this that I'm doing, it's in vain. It's not even for me. It's for this other person who isn't open to the process. If I think about all the things I want to do better, I want to sleep seven and a half hours a night. I want to drink 120 ounces of water. I want to wake up and start meditating. All the things that I want to do. How dare I say, well, this person, you're trying to get them to do something they don't even want to do. I have a hard time doing the stuff I want to do. (laughs) How dare I say to this person, and you stop smoking. It's like, they want to do that. They want to gossip. They want to, you know, be jealous of you or, you know, pick at you or do all the, like they want to do those things. So now we're telling them, not only do you need to change your behavior, you need to want what I want for you. I guess on the reverse too, if a parent is still trying to control a child's behavior, like you should do this, you should do that. Is it in that same acceptance that, okay, this parent is going to continue to try to infringe their opinion on my lifestyle and I have the choice to set boundaries and minimize time or speak my needs to them, et cetera, et cetera? Absolutely. I think it depends on the age of the child. If a child is, you know, let's say over 25 and they are financially independent, I don't know how much power a parent has over that child in their life choices anymore. I think a lot of rearing that we do is when children are you know, younger and as they get older, it kind of, it should dwindle, it should change a bit. So as they get older, it's really like you just have this advisory role if they want it, if they trust that you're the person to advise them. It's not necessarily like I'm telling my 40-year-old child what to do. I've met, you know, some parents, they're like 80 and they're like, their kids are like 60 and they're telling them what to do. I'm like, wait a minute, this is, (laughs) you know, and I get it to a certain extent, but it's, My kids listen to me some, which they should because I'm not always right. You know, so just because you're older, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know everything. You know what's best for a person. You want what's best for a person. But I may not know what's best. This thing that you're trying to do that I'm against, that might actually be the thing that you're supposed to do. A lot of times in generational trauma, I have a friend who's who's first generation immigrant and her parents went through a lot to get over here. And because they went through so much to get here, she minimizes her impact of dynamics in the family that felt dysfunctional. She'll say, well, at least I didn't have to go through that. You know, they went through this super heavy trauma to get here and I have all this freedom and this and that and all these things. And they minimize maybe the emotional support that they're going through. How can people start to... I guess, recognize and validate for themselves that like multiple things are true, that your parents could have gone through very heavy trauma and difficulty and there is space to hold for that and you're not responsible for making it up to them in some way, shape or form. We don't have to compare trauma. Mm. You know, it goes back to that A score, whether it's an eight or a two or a 10 or a three, I think when people have trauma, there is this idea like my trauma was worse than your trauma. And it's like, that's not necessarily true. I don't know if what you survive feels worse than what I'm dealing with right now. I think that's very unfair to say this thing happened to me and it's bigger than the thing that happened to you. It's one of those things where you really have to think about other people have trauma, but it doesn't mean that their trauma was bigger or less in impact to you. And so even with our parents, like knowing their stories and maybe their story is really horrific. Yeah, that was terrible. And this is too. There's a lot of, you know, gray in that, that there is no, this is worse than that. All of this is bad and it doesn't need to be equal. It's just stuff that was unhealthy for us, period. You know, in that acceptance and acknowledgement of all of those things being true, that's where the door opening for change can happen. If you can't even acknowledge that it was happening or something didn't feel alignment, how can you move through it? How can you have change? How can you be different than for the next person too? Well, we live in a society where moving on without resolution is pretty popular and common. 
this thing happened, we'll just reconvene with this person and we won't talk about it. And typically when that's the case, it just happens again because nothing has been resolved. Nothing is different. It's just like, okay, well, this will happen again in the future. I don't know when, but it'll happen again in the future. So I'm quickly interrupting this episode to invite you if you're ready to start your manifestation journey, or if anything you've heard in our manifestation episodes has piqued your interest to begin. We have a la carte workshops in everything from the basics bundle, which is what we recommend to everyone who starts. It's the formula that actually teaches you how to manifest, unblocked inner child, and unblocked shadow. We also have a la carte workshops on love and money. But the real gem is the Pathway membership because it encompasses every single workshop we have. It's a year-long membership with full access to the few a la carte offerings we have and exclusive workshops not available anywhere else, such as the daily practice, which is what everybody in the Pathway uses, hopefully at least three times a week to daily in order to truly create the new neural pathways that one needs in order to manifest and houses the library of our deep imaginings, which is our unique hypnosis process that allows you to get into your subconscious and overwrite those old neural pathways, creating the new ones. You can use our special code EXPANDED, all caps, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D, to receive $20 off your first a la carte workshop purchase or $20 off your first month of the pathway. Again, that's all caps, EXPANDED, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D. Okay, now back to the episode. One thing that really stuck out to me, I think it was in one of the question sections, but you had said, how is continuing on the cycle impacting your mental and emotional health? When people can really take a look at, oh, I may think, oh, okay, I'm just keeping the peace. I'm not setting boundaries. I'm not speaking my needs because that's uncomfortable. That's stressful. That's awkward. I might get shamed. I might get judgment from the family, but how is it impacting you on a mental health issue to not be speaking your piece, to not be setting boundaries, to allow it to continue on. Do you find that people have a hard time recognizing the impact on them and minimize, I guess, like their impact? Absolutely. I think it causes a lot of anxiety and depression. You know, when you think about relationships, like, would you really want to be in a relationship with someone who is so afraid to talk to you that they can't eat? That is how shut down we are to people. That is how unwilling we are to accept responsibility, that a person would rather ghost us or ignore us or not even talk to us, but have a really big issue. That's pretty scary that other humans are having that impact on other humans. We don't realize sometimes like the anxiety and the depression that comes about when you have to engage with certain family members, when you have to be in the company of certain family members, that there are just things where it's like, you know, days before or days after, you just stuck in this thought cycle of, oh my gosh, and then my grandmother said this thing again. And so it's like this continuous cycle of what is going on in this relationship. It's interesting too, when you think of it through an inner child perspective, when you have difficulty setting those boundaries or having those conversations or distancing or whatever the decision is, think of advocating for your inner child. When you can say it in third person, you know, what is this inner child feeling or what is this piece of me feeling? You can actually create distance and empathy for yourself in a way that oftentimes we sort of go right by. Yeah, I think so too. Sometimes we are advocating for that younger version of ourselves. Little Jessica needs this. And so that's why I'm going to say it because for many years, I haven't been able to speak up for myself in this way. As you say, it's like, it's kind of step-by-step process, allowing yourself to, okay, I'm going to function in this family system differently than I have before. And there's probably going to be some pushback 
people are not going to like what I'm saying. They're, they're going to invalidate it. How can someone cultivate support outside of the system as they're navigating creating these new relationships with their family? You know, one of the biggest support systems is friendships. You know, from the time you're in elementary school until the end of life, there are people we can be cultivating relationships with, right? So friendship is a very deep connection that we can have with others. Mentorship, sometimes that's a teacher, sometimes that's somebody in your neighborhood. It could be your friend's parents. That could be really helpful. Therapy is certainly a supportive space for you to be able to not just learn the tools, but also have support with implementing this stuff. Because sometimes it's really helpful to have accountability, to talk about, oh my gosh, I had this big problem with so-and-so, and then feel compelled to do something about it and then have to go back and tell your therapist, okay, this is what I did. You know, So that accountability can be very helpful. You know, Spiritual leaders can be another help. Sometimes you know, the the person you're in a relationship with, your partner, your husband, your wife, those sorts of supports can be important as well. And then what about processing through some of the emotions that come up around facing these dynamics, anger, grief, resentment? How do you, how do you suggest navigating them, processing them, feeling through them? The fear of feeling the extent of these emotions kind of keeps people from even diving into them. They're like, I'll get swallowed whole if I even think about processing that. So what sort of insight do you have there? Feelings are meant to be felt. And I think often when we're feeling something uncomfortable, there's this desire to get rid of it. So I'm angry at it. I have to get rid of it. I'm guilt. I feel guilty for this. I have to get rid of it. When, you know, it's really telling you, you care. You're angry because you care. You feel guilty because you care. You feel this because you care. If you didn't feel anything, then that's a sign you don't care. So it's actually a good thing that you're concerned about this. Now, how do we get you to be concerned and not consumed? So that's more of the concern. You don't want it to be like this, oh my gosh, I'm just, I can't stop thinking about this thing versus, you know, maybe this is something you think about from time to time, but hopefully there are some moments in the day where you can release the thoughts. How can someone go about breaking that cycle? You have a section on cycle breakers and really what is that, what does it look like to be a cycle breaker? What does it look like to be that, that person of change within your family dynamics? It looks like a person who really has to build a support system outside of the family because you will have to create a new version of family if that support isn't available in the family. You become a cycle breaker when you identify the ways in which you want to be different. There are many ways to be different. Sometimes it's simply going to college. Sometimes it's not joining the family business. Sometimes it's not going to college for the thing that everybody else in your family went to college for. Sometimes it is not being an addict if you come from a family where that's prevalent. It can be, you know, maybe not being married or, you know, all sorts of things. It is doing something different than what is predominantly done in your family. And because you're doing something different, there will likely be some backlash. What about the parents who might be listening, who are thinking about, oh my gosh, maybe I impacted my kid in a negative way, or maybe some of my behaviors impacted them and they took distance or they want boundaries, or maybe I shamed them when they tried to share things. How can they, if you know they're having interest, they're listening, they're obviously self-aware, how can they start to go on that healing journey? We get write-ins from parents too. They're like, oh my gosh, after doing inner child work, I feel like I totally messed up my kid. What do I do? How can those parents maybe start the healing process? You know, I, I think how do you start is based on your situation. I think it's baby steps. Sometimes we try to think of things like, I want to be this, and we see the end, and we don't think about all those small steps that you take to get to that space. And it's really thinking about your big goal and mapping out all those little things in between. It's in the moment. It's moment to moment. 
It is all of the ways in which you choose to show up in your family. I think so often many of us are showing up in the world in ways we wish we could show up in our families. And if we just took a little bit of our work self or our friendship self to our families, that would be all the ways in which you would change. Acknowledgement from parents is so important. If they feel that they something was done wrong or they didn't let, or even if a kid comes to you and says, hey, this impacted me, a parent saying like, wow, I'm so sorry that happened or even accountability. But I think it's really hard for people to take accountability, to apologize, to get to that state. Why do you think that that is so hard and that people struggle with really kind of accepting and taking accountability? Like you were saying, okay, sometimes mom's wrong. What if that apology state is very difficult for some people? Sometimes people are unwilling to see themselves as flawed. And when they cannot see themselves as flawed, they won't. They will say it's you. They will say someone made them do it. You do it too. All of these really interesting things because seeing themselves as a real person who makes mistakes can be their undoing. And so they must lie. They must say that it didn't happen that way. That's not how... I saw it. I meant this. And that is really unfortunate because it blocks the path to open communication and certainly healing. Do you find that that's modeled? Children learn it from parents and then they can then enact that. Like even if you're thinking of breaking generational curses, creating new patterns going forward within that as well. I I think it's modeled for sure. I think parents model a, a lot of inappropriate behaviors that we wouldn't want kids to engage in. I get it, but to a certain extent, um, James Baldwin has a quote that, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. So it's, it's one thing to say to someone, hey, don't do this. And it's another thing for you to actually not do it. That is what the person can follow. They can trust you. When you're saying to someone, hey, don't do this, and you're doing it, it's like, what? And I think, too, in the family dynamics, you can have a family member who apologizes, but if their behavior continues, then that's kind of knowing where their limitations are at. Absolutely. Talk a little bit about the power people have that maybe they don't recognize when it comes to change. There was one section that really hit on sitting in a toxic environment, dysfunctional dynamic, we are not recognizing necessarily that we have the power. We have a choice in this matter. How can people start to see that they have a choice? And if they are choosing to stay in the dynamic, like what options they have within there as well? Adult relationships are filled with choices. You really do get to decide who you want to be in relationship, what the frequency of that contact is, and all of that. You know, so it's like I choose to be in relationship with my mother because I hear a lot of people saying I have to talk to so-and-so. I choose to talk to so-and-so. So that is owning your power in the situation. No one is forcing you to do anything. All of this is happening from your place of willingness. Now, it's true. If you don't do it, there may be consequences, but you're still choosing to do it. It's like a person has to take their trash out. No, they don't. They can let their trash overflow and bugs and maggots. And, you know, that can happen. That does happen. So it is a choice to take even your garbage out. It is a choice to show up in a relationship. So when you really own that I am here because I want to be here, you can think about other things that you are doing in the relationship. I am allowing this person to do X, Y, and Z because I want to allow this person. No one's forcing you. This is all a choice and you are choosing by every action, by every word, what you want to do in that relationship. And I love the the concept of like keeping your side of the street clean and not trying to change the other person. In that, is there a way in which you can, I guess like when you think of ghosting, people might feel entitled to ghost someone because, you know, they don't like their behavior, but they're not actually stating their behavior. They're just ignoring them. So I guess what is the line of, okay, I feel like this behavior is harmful, but I'm too scared to actually communicate it. So I'm kind of hiding in avoidance. 
where is the line between they're allowed to take space, but this is the way to do it in a way that is within their integrity. So ghosting is interesting in dysfunctional families. I have seen where people have been told about their behavior and they refuse to believe it. And so when the person eventually stops talking to them, they're shocked. They stopped talking to me for nothing. It's like you kept coming to their events drunk. They said it twice. How many times does a person have to say it for it to not be ghosting? How many times do I have to say, well, that felt made me feel uncomfortable. Please don't say that to me for it to be ghosting. People can see things as ghosting when they don't want to accept something. You know, I've heard of situations where, you know, you have this person explode, cuss everybody out, and then they're calling everybody the next day like nothing happened. Are you being ghosted? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't know why they stopped talking to me. Could it be the thing you did yesterday? (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's like, how how much do people have to explain to you? I I think I've seen more like legitimate ghosting outside of families. Within families, there's this like, people have been doing things for a really long time and the person gets tired of it and they do just stop talking to them. But it's like, hey, I've been dealing with this for 16 years. I did just stop on a random Tuesday, but hey, it's been 16 years. So I I wouldn't necessarily consider that ghosting. But I I do think that there are people you can safely have a conversation with. And there are others where you can go to them with this information and they will re-injure you. They will cuss you out. They will start a physical altercation. And that can be the same person who said, they didn't tell me what happened. So It's very delicate when we're talking about unhealthy people being able to hear certain information. That's really powerful because it gives licensing for people to not have to, for lack of a better word, like go into the lion's den with someone if they've already communicated to them, this is how I feel about this. This hurts me. This injures me. And they're in full acceptance, can't handle that conversation. So it is better in those cases to just take the space. Yeah, I've I've certainly heard of people, you know, having a very direct conversation with someone and they don't want to hear it. Well, that must not be the problem. There has to be a bigger problem. No, this is the problem right here. I'm telling you what the problem is. You know, people don't have to listen to your grievance with them. And they can say that you didn't even express one. Like that's the beauty of being human. We could just live by whatever narrative we want. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have to be true. So I think sometimes there are situations where people are ghosted and then there are others. I, I remember a long time ago, I had this client and her children didn't talk to her. And the way she described it to me was like, I was a great parent. I was wonderful. I don't know why they don't talk to me. I never believed that story because that's just the weirdest thing to happen. For you to be a great parent and your kids never talk to you, Not one kid, but two. They talk to each other. They talk to their father. They don't talk to you. So you can tell me that this is a story. I don't necessarily believe that because it doesn't make sense. So sometimes, and, and, you know, that person will say, I was ghosted. Were you? Or was something done that you don't want to talk about? Or that they can't even see. They can't even see how their behavior was potentially harmful. Or that. Mm. What about when you have these separations or boundaries or space, the impact on the other members in the family system? So many times, like if someone wants to set a boundary with, you know, a sibling and they have that dynamic, then the parents are like, but you should just be friends. You know, you should just connect with your sister. You should just be there for them. It's family. And they kind of layer on some of the, the shame and guilt to continue the family system what would be some advice for dealing with sort of the backlash from other family members and how they're going to perceive this this new version of you stepping into your choices? I think when you're dealing with other family members, you sort of, there's scripts in the book to talk about this. Like, you know, I understand that's your relationship with them, but that's not mine. Or please respect my perspective. I cannot 
be in this relationship anymore. You really have to advocate for your peace of mind. It's not up to this other person to free you and say, okay, I completely understand. You have to let them know why you're making this choice and how it's important to you. And you may not even want to tell them why, but just say, hey, this is the choice I made. Please respect it. Oh, man. I'm just thinking of like everyone out there processing the boundaries they need to set, the places they need to go within these dynamics. I think the the hope and like sort of the silver lining and the, I don't know, at least the motivation for me when thinking about facing these these situations is that you're not just doing it for you. You're doing it for the continuation of your family line that is not going to deal with settle, condone behaviors of dysfunction. And you're kind of being the stopgap to those dynamics happening. That gives people a lot of power. How do you see that? Or how do you, when you have to set difficult boundaries or hold that boundary for a year with that family member, how do you move through the feelings of discomfort and grief and all of those things, but still have like, nope, this is the right choice for me. And I know I'm doing right by myself and future generations. Well, it takes practice. I can't say that that was an easy year. It was just a year in which I refused to concede and continue to be gaslit by someone and tormented in their behaviors and not able to to speak up for myself. So the greater need for me was the emotional freedom and not necessarily being liked. Because sometimes I I understand that this person is going to be upset at me. I get that. Yep. And I'm okay with that for the right reason. Oof, that is such a powerful point to sit in the fact that I might not be liked in this. They might not understand why I'm doing this. They may think that I'm wrong. I'm the problem. And I don't need to fix it. I don't need to convince them. I definitely am fall into that trap where I'm like, no, 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 I need to explain to them. If they just knew what they were doing wrong, like they'd get it. I'll just, you know, explain it to them or show them the article or show them this. And what I'm hearing from you too is like, it's really not my job to do that. My job is to take care of me and set boundaries where that's needed. It is. How do you, (laughs) how do you not explain to someone (laughs) when you want to say like, hey, but this is, you know. Well, you can explain to people. You yeah. know, if if that's what you want to do, I would just wonder why you're explaining. Is the explanation for you or for them? Will it really help them to understand? Or are you trying to get their approval in your decision making? With the parent dynamic, it's really hard for kids to feel that they're disappointing their parent, no matter the dysfunction that may have occurred. Mm-hmm. How do you see that role play out? How do you see kids navigating or adult? I should say adult children navigating through that. You know, I I think it is hard to disappoint your parents for sure. And I think that's a part of becoming an adult, knowing that you will, that there are choices you may make for your life that your parents don't agree with. I'm sure there is some mother somewhere saying, as they look at me like, oh my gosh, you have a bright lipstick. It's not the choice you would make, but it's the one I'm making. You know, so I I think sometimes we have to live with the discomfort of our parents not liking everything that we do. And also knowing that those things aren't necessarily bad or wrong. It's just different. It almost sounds like it's learning how to not take everything personal or as a reflection of your self-worth. Absolutely. Yes. I am worthy even if you're upset at me. I still love you even if you don't agree with everything I do. We can coexist and be different from each other in some ways. Last question before we wrap up here too. People that are looking for validation outside of themselves, especially in family dynamics, if they're not going to get the validation from mom or dad or siblings as they're navigating these new boundaries, how can someone start to self-validate in order to allow them to see that they can take care of their needs? And if they're rejected by friends, family, whatever, they're still okay and worthy. There are some people who will not validate you. And those people may be family. And when it is your family, you have to decide if you want to work hard for that validation that you may never receive or if you want to start to 
maybe figure out how to validate yourself, how to honor your voice despite what other things, how to find that validation and support in other places. Because validation is really our desire to be seen. I want to be seen by my family. But what happens when people don't want to see you or they only want to see you as the version that they create? Sometimes you can't be that. You can't be that and be well. You know, so you have to decide, okay, how willing, how much am I willing to compromise to be this version of myself that doesn't fit? I would venture to say it's not healthy for people. And sometimes, you know, there are some things you can compromise, but, you know, very often it's like, you know, there are certain things that can really deplete us when we are no longer in a certain space. I think there's a lot of wisdom in what you've said today and also in the book. I really, really recommend anyone who's kind of hearing all of this and reading it felt very self-validating because the way that you describe some dysfunctional structures, dynamics within families, the scripts, you have some mantras in there even of how you can start to Oh no. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm right. in feeling this dynamic didn't feel good and here are options of moving forward. It really is such a comprehensive book on the subject. Where can people find the book, connect with you, learn more? Yes, please visit my website, nedratawab.com. The book is available in most places that books are sold. Please support your local bookstore if you have the means to do so and get the book from the library. It's so important that the book is you know, available to everyone. So if you cannot purchase the book, please borrow the book. Love that. Thank you so much, Nedra. This has been so helpful. And thank you for putting all of this beautiful work out into the world and healing generations and generations of families. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning into the episode. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, we did. And in case you're not totally ready to join the pathway yet, I wanted to share a few of our free offerings that I'll often suggest to people as a little bit of a blueprint to get them started on their manifestation journey. The first place I like to direct people completely for free is the motivation. You can see it linked below or on our homepage as our testimony library. And it's categorized by different subjects, whether you're calling in career, money, love, wellness, and much more. When you're reading about a member's experience of what they manifested, you're actually seeing to believe and showing your subconscious that that very thing is possible for you. The second place I like to direct people is to the free clarity exercise, which is also linked below. In it, you get to try our own unique hypnosis process, learn about the science and some journaling prompts. And the best part about this You'll get a tiny taste of what it's like to go into your hypnotic state, bring your subconscious forward, and create new neural pathways while receiving clarity. And the third thing, if you haven't listened to it on this podcast yet, please go back to the episode titled Manifestation 101, where you'll learn the basics of neural manifestation to truly understand this process. So go ahead and check out those free resources, the motivation, the free clarity exercise, and the episode Manifestation 101, all linked below. And in an effort to make sure to have representation in this process series, go ahead and submit any process testimonials you have, especially to our LGBTQ plus community, our BIPOC, as well as the Ys, which is anyone in the community who is 45 and over. All right, we'll be back next week.